everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we are continuing with my Minecraft archaeology series and because it's Halloween this weekend, I thought I'd look at a site that fit the theme. Bran Castle in Transylvania, Romania, which you might know better as the inspiration behind Dracula's castle in Bram Stoker's novel. Now, there are a lot of complexities and misconceptions about Dracula, Bran Castle, and Vlad III, or Vlad the Impaler, who was the supposed historical inspiration for the character. But let's start with the castle. Bran Castle was originally built between 1377 and 1388 AD after King Louis I of Hungary gave the Saxons of Kronstadt, which is now called Brasov, permission to build a castle. The castle was built on a steep cliff between Brasov to the north and the Wallachian border to the south. It was mostly used as a customs house, taking a 3% tax on all goods coming into and out of Transylvania by that particular pass. Now, I've done a lot in this series talking about sites, but I haven't spoken as much about the landscapes that those sites are in. The location of a site within the world, within a landscape, is just as archaeologically important as what we find at the actual site. The Carpathian Mountains more or less snake their way around Romania, continuing into Ukraine, Slovakia, and Poland in the north, and Bulgaria and Serbia in the south. The majority of Romania is located either in the Carpathians or in its foothills, and most of Transylvania specifically is connected to the Carpathians. So this mountain range is a major part of the landscape here. Brasov as a town or village was situated at the crossroads of major trade routes between the Ottoman Empire and the rest of Western Europe for centuries. If you look at our landscape here, we have two large mountains more or less flanking Bran Castle, which isn't in Brasov, but it's, it's on the way. So we have these two large mountains flanking the castle, with valleys to the north, southeast, and southwest. Now, it may seem like someone trying to travel between Transylvania and Wallachia might be able to bypass the castle by taking this route over here, but this valley actually turns into a rather difficult mountain range that would be really hard, if not impossible, to get wagons over. So one of the primary ways to get between Brasov in the north and Wallachia to the south is through this southwestern pass here. And since that's the case, you can see how Bran Castle really just controls this area by being right at the juncture between the roads to the north and the ones heading south. The elevation of the castle also gives it an impressive vantage point over the valley. My render distance here is set to 16 chunks, which goes out a total of 256 blocks. Honestly, this is the biggest landscape I have ever built in Minecraft, spanning over 700 blocks from north to south. But just look at this place. Even in Minecraft, where we can't capture all of the details, isn't it just gorgeous? And hopefully now you can see how important the landscape is. Castles, generally speaking, are about control controlling a landscape and those who are in, around, or passing through it. Building a castle in this landscape that we had at the beginning would make it really difficult for us to understand how that castle functioned throughout its history, because we would be missing the entire context of its landscape. Okay, so now that we have that covered, let's talk about the castle itself. As I said earlier, Bran Castle was first built between 1377 and 1388. It primarily served as a customs house, but also helped to defend Transylvania from the Ottoman Empire. In 1407, Sigismund of Luxembourg gave the castle to Prince Mercia of Wallachia so that he could use it as a refuge while fighting against the Turks. In 1419, when Prince Mercia died, Sigismund was wary of the political instability in Wallachia, so he instead gave the castle to the princes of Transylvania. The Turks did actually invade Transylvania in 1441, but they were defeated at Bran by John Hunyadi, who was a prominent Hungarian military and political figure at the time. And as always, I apologize if I am mispronouncing any and all of these words. I'm, again, as always, I'm doing my best, but I apologize if I mispronounce them. But what about the Dracula connection, I hear you asking? Well, let's start by talking about Vlad Tsepes, Vlad Dracula, or Vlad the Impaler. Vlad Dracula was a military leader, or voivode, of Wallachia three separate times. First from October to November in 1448, then again from 1456 to 1462, and again in December. December of 1476 or January of 1477 before he was killed in combat. During his first reign and the beginning of his second, he was actually allies with Bran and Brasov due to his assistance with conflicts at the border, although it was a bit of a tense allyship. But in 1459, Brasov was going to raise the customs tax, which was generally collected at Bran. Brasov had also offered a safe haven for several people who wanted the Wallachian throne, which Vlad didn't really like. So in 1459, 
He marched right past Bran Castle and into Brashov, where he burned the suburbs to the ground and murdered hundreds of its inhabitants by impaling them. This was not the first time he had done something like this to a town, so you can understand why he became known as a ruthless tyrant and gained the name Vlad the Impaler. But as ruthless a person as Vlad Tsepesh was, he didn't actually have much connection with Bran Castle. There's no evidence he ever captured the castle itself in his march on Brashov. It seems more likely that he simply passed by, and if he was questioned, he just kind of acted as if everything was fine. In fact, many historians argue that Vlad actually never set foot in Bran Castle. So how is he connected to Dracula if he likely never set foot in what is supposedly Dracula's castle? Well, for starters, Vlad Tsepesh was almost certainly the inspiration for Dracula, but probably only in name. Stoker in his novel actually takes a certain amount of care to make sure that his Dracula doesn't match any historical figure. There's no mention anywhere of Dracula impaling his victims, which is an odd thing to leave out if you want to base a villain off of Vlad Tsepesh. Also, there's no mention of the historical figure in any of Bram Stoker's notes, which is also odd if he were trying to base one of his main characters off of the guy. Lastly, there is a connection drawn to Vlad Tsepesh within the novel, but it's actually later dismissed by Van Helsing in favor of another nameless Transylvanian. Given all of that, most scholars believe that the inspiration Stoker took from Vlad Tsepesh was in name only. Now, Bran Castle is a different story. Dracula's castle is described as being, quote, on the edge of a terrific precipice with occasionally a deep rift where there is a chasm with silver threads where the rivers wind in deep gorges through the forests. Bran Castle is on the edge of an impressive precipice, surrounded by valleys and gorges into the surrounding mountains, and rivers running all across the landscape. There is actually no other castle in Romania, let alone Transylvania, that matches that description. At this point though, you may be thinking, well, that description is a little bit off from Bran Castle though, seeing as we just spent a bunch of time talking about the landscape. And you'd be right, it is a little off. But it's important to know that Stoker never actually visited Romania himself. He had at least one book on the subject and spoke with those who had visited, but his descriptions in the book are all secondhand to start with, and there's likely to be a bit of dramatic flair thrown in for the story. So Bran Castle almost certainly served as inspiration for Dracula's castle, but it never actually housed the person often named as the inspiration for Dracula, who himself is actually inspiration largely in name only. So what's the history of the castle? Well, we've covered the period before Vlad Tsepesh, and we've covered the period during Vlad Tsepesh, but what happened between 1458 and the present day? Well, from 1458 to 1486, Bran was controlled by the Voivodes, and apparently the Chatelain often demanded supplies from the surrounding region, including Brashov, at the expense of the region's inhabitants. Many felt like they were being exploited by the Chatelain, and therefore the Voivode in both Wallachia and Transylvania. In 1498, the citizens of Brashov purchased rights to use the castle from King Vladislav II of Hungary for 10 years. Now this is an interesting story, okay? So, King Albert II of Germany was king of the Holy Roman Empire, which shared a border with the Kingdom of Hungary, which is where Transylvania was located at the time. And Transylvania had a large Saxon population, so they had strong connections to that region anyway. Albert II died without an heir on October 27th of 1439, but he bequeathed his throne to his then unborn son. Now, there's no way he knew that he was having a son for sure. Like his wife was pregnant, but he had no idea if it was a son or a daughter. So just take a moment to think about the guts it takes to say, I leave my kingdom to my unborn son who may actually not be a son and might not be born healthy enough to rule or even survive to adulthood. But you know what? It's fine, right? But that's only the beginning of the story. Since Albert II died before the child was born, not everyone in the Holy Roman Empire agreed that they should be betting the security of their empire on him having a healthy son in four months' time, which is perfectly understandable. And some of them also made the very good point that even if the child is a boy, he would be an infant. Walking and talking? Kind of important for a ruler to be able to do, so yeah. Basically, only the Austrian estates accepted that Albert's son could rule if he did actually have a son. And as it turns out, Albert II 
did actually have a son named Ladislaus, who was born four months after his father died. Because his father had bequeathed the throne to him on his deathbed before Ladislaus was even born, Ladislaus became known as Ladislaus the Posthumous. But much of the empire didn't recognize him as its ruler, so he inherits a now fractured empire immediately upon birth, four months after his father dies, and becomes known as Ladislaus the Posthumous, and then his mother died when he was only two years old. Seriously, this poor kid. So because he was an infant and Albert II didn't have a son when he died, most of the Hungarian kings felt Ladislaus's coronation was invalid and offered the crown to Vladislaus III of Poland instead. Civil war broke out which lasted for years in the region. Vladislaus III died in 1444 and the Diet of Hungary agreed to acknowledge Ladislaus as king if Frederick III, who was Ladislaus's guardian, renounced his guardianship. Frederick III refused, so they elected John Hunyadi as regent in 1446, which is the same guy who defeated the Turks at Bran Castle in 1441. The Estates of Austria forced Frederick to resign his guardianship in 1452 and to hand Ladislaus over to them, which he did. John Hunyadi resigned his regency in 1453, which allowed Hungary to put Ladislaus back on the throne. Unfortunately, though, Ladislaus unexpectedly died in Prague in 1457 after some conflict with both the Ottomans and John Hunyadi's son, who was also named Ladislaus. Ladislaus the posthumous was only 17 when he died. So how does Ladislaus II factor into all of this? Well, his mother, Elizabeth of Austria, was actually Ladislaus the posthumous' older sister and the daughter of Albert II. When Ladislaus died, she and her husband tried to lay claim to the throne, but they were ignored by both Hungary and Bohemia. This led to a series of lengthy conflicts over who the rightful heir to Bohemia was, which eventually led to Ladislaus' coronation in 1471. But the coronation was only for Bohemia, not for Hungary, and there was a lot of continued ongoing conflict with Matthias Corvinus, who controlled Hungary and was also a son of John Hunyadi. Peace treaties were eventually signed, but Vladislaus also continued attempting to spread Catholicism across Bohemia, which caused even more conflict. Basically, by 1498, Vladislaus II had spent so many funds and resources on the conflicts that the treasury was rather tight. So the citizens of Brasov, noticing an opportunity to make some profit and also stop running the risk of exploitation by the Chatelain for a few years, offered to purchase the right to use the castle and collect the customs tax as profits in exchange for a loan to the king of a thousand florins. The idea was that King Vladislaus would repay the loan after 10 years had passed, but instead he actually took out several more loans from the city before eventually being unable to pay them, and the city of Brasov gained ownership of the castle in 1533. Quite the story, right? Interestingly, the record goes relatively quiet for Bran Castle after that. There was an explosion at the powder mill in 1593, and a storm destroyed the roof in 1617. There were also reconstruction efforts from 1613 to 1629, particularly around the Gate Tower, the Round Tower, and the Donjon. In 1651, Brasov sold the castle to George II Rakotsi who was a prince of Transylvania, and then in 1723 the North Tower was renovated. Finally, in 1836, the border between Wallachia and Transylvania, and therefore also the Customs House, was moved to the mountains themselves, making Grand Castle less important for both trade and fortifications. Extensive damage was done to the building in the Revolution of 1848 and in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877, and extensive repairs were carried out in 1886. In 1888, Brasov transferred the castle to the regional forestry service, and it actually served as a place for foresters, woodsmen, and inspectors to stay over the next 30 years. Then, in 1920, after Transylvania became part of Greater Romania in the aftermath of World War I, the city council of Brasov decided to give the castle to Queen Marie. It became one of her favorite residences, and she had a lot of restoration work done from 1920 to 1938. That means that much of what you've been watching me build is at least as old as the renovations Queen Marie carried out, but she did take care not to change much of the look of the castle. I did nothing which would take away the feudal appearance, she says in her memoirs. I didn't transform the quickness of the stairs, I didn't raise the roofs, nor did I straighten the crooked rooms. Most of the Queen's renovations seem to have been comfort-based, including water and electricity. We can therefore say much of the structure is likely at least as old as the repairs done in 1886, and much of them are likely to be earlier. One example of this is the thickness of the outer walls, which seem to be about 1 to 2 meters thick. Castles built for pleasure or as a summer residence tend not to have such thick outer walls, because they're not built for function. Thick outer walls on a castle generally is a sign that the castle was used as fortification, so these outer walls are probably quite old. 
When Queen Marie died in 1938, her heart was originally placed in Stella Maris Chapel in Balchik, but it was moved to Brand Castle's chapel in 1940 when Dobruja was ceded to Bulgaria. Princess Ileana, Marie's daughter, inherited Brand Castle when her mother died, but Ileana and her family were forced to flee the country with the rise of the communist regime. As a result, Brand Castle lay largely empty until 1956 when it was turned into a museum, but it soon fell into disrepair. Restoration began again in 1987, and it was again opened as a museum in 1993. Ileana's heirs fought for the legal return of the castle, which they won in 2006, though the Romanian government provisionally administered the castle for another three years. Now, it is owned by Archduke Dominic, Archduchess Marie Magdalena, and Archduchess Elizabeth, and is a working museum. And that's it for Bran Castle. Quite a rich and varied history, some of which relates to Bram Stoker's famous character, and much of which actually doesn't. I think we can all agree, though, that much of the actual history of Bran Castle, Brasov, and this area of Transylvania are just as interesting. Personally, it's definitely on my list of places to visit once things open up a bit more, because if it's this interesting from my desk and this picturesque in Minecraft, I can only imagine how much better it would be to see the castle and hear its stories in person. If you happen to be in the area or want to visit when you're able to do so, check out the link to the museum in the description down below. Also, thank you very much to the staff at Brand Castle Museum for helping with so much of the research for this video. Their website is an invaluable resource of information, so if you want to find out more more, check out the link in the description down below. And that's it! If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and consider subscribing to the channel. Was there anything that surprised you? Let me know down in the comments! Also, if you have an archaeological site you'd like me to build, comment down below and I'll see about adding it to the list. And for anyone who's interested, I recently launched a Patreon! Patrons get access to the schematics for my Minecraft builds, including this one, along with things like digital site reports with more information about the site, patron-only live streams, and monthly Q&As. If that sounds like something you're interested in, or you'd just like to support the channel, check out the link in the description box below. Also, thank you very much to all of my current Patreons. Without your support, these videos wouldn't be possible, so thank you very much for helping me do what I do. That's all from me for today. Thank you all for tuning in, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye!